this the same way we always do. Of course, everyone is welcome, and we want to ask that everyone will bring a side dish to go with hamburgers, and if we have any leftover hot dogs. Uh, so, you know, you know, you bring what you want, but side dish to go with hamburgers. Uh, I like baked beans, I like potato salad, macaroni salad, you know, throwing some ideas out there. So, I love chili dogs, actually. A good chili dog with cheese, chili, and onions. Oh, my goodness. Or, or sauerkraut. Oh, man. I'll tell you, I like sauerkraut. Man, that's a acquired taste, some people say, but I really like it. It's, it's pretty good. So. Well, good morning. As you can tell, we, we're doing things a little different this morning, you know? I looked over here, and I see Mr. Chuck sitting right here. You know, he's over here, and I'm like, I like that. That's really cool. Something different. Uh, the choir gets up and sings, and y'all sounded very good, by the way. Good job. Um, let me ask you a question, choir. Was it harder to get up in the middle of service to come sing instead of being up here already? We don't care. You don't care? That's good. That's good. Because a lot of people, man, don't call me out. I don't want to go up there. We didn't know he was going to do that. That's, and that's okay. That's actually a good thing. There are, there are two constants. In life. Number one is God. He's constant. The second constant in life is change. And then change is okay. Sometimes change is needed. Sometimes change, we don't like it. Sometimes it's hard. Uh, I actually, I pride myself on change. I, I, I've learned to adapt to change. Uh, that's the one thing you learn when you work for government is even if the will is not broken, they're going to try to fix it. And so we change all the time. And change is good. So when we do things that are, that are a little bit different, it's okay. Like today, for instance, I'm in blue jeans <laughs> and a t-shirt. Change. Not saying it will be this way every Sunday, but I'm just saying. Change is good. I'm not 100% sure on the, the dates and times, but... We haven't had a vacation Bible school in how long? Can someone tell me when the last one was? How many? Five. Five years. Five years it has been since we've had a vacation Bible school. That's cool. Because God's working. God's moving. So my question is to you right now, and as we get into today's message, is, is where are you at? While God's moving. Where yet? Because I'm going to kind of point out where we need to be today and from here on out while God's moving. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the, the story of the Samaritan woman and Jesus at the well. A um, little bit of recap. Jesus was on his way and he had to pass through Samaria and there was, he stopped at the well of Jacob, and he wanted to get a drink of water, because he was tired, and the disciples went off, and they went to go buy food, because they were hungry, I mean, that's in my own heart, I feel them. So they went to go get food, but Jesus stayed behind, and a woman came up to the well, and he asked her for water, and the first thing that she said is, hang on there a minute, you're a Jew, we don't get along, why are you asking me for water? And Jesus said, hang on, no, 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 no. If you knew who I was and the type of water that I could give, you'd be asking me for a drink. So Jesus went on and he basically told her, hey, hey, I am the Messiah. Then he goes on and he tells her everything that she'd done in her life. And she got so excited that she went off to tell everybody in the village about what Jesus just said and who he was. Have you ever been that excited to tell someone something? I I'm talking like, I'm talking, Mr. Chuck, excited, Auburn beat Alabama excited, okay? I got to laugh over there, Ms. Ann. <laughs> I'm talking excited, all right? This woman was so excited to go tell these people what had happened. And then when Jesus' disciples came back, the first thing they're going to do is they're going to, you know, they wanted to question him. And they see him, see him Jesus talking to this woman, but they didn't. And Jesus basically points out to him, he says, hang on a minute. There's something a little more important than food right now. And that's my father's work. Sometimes church.
church, we get so focused on how hungry we are physically that we forget how hungry the world is spiritually. Jesus told his disciples this right here in John chapter 4. He said this in verse 35. He said, you know the saying, four months between planting and harvest. But I say, wake up and look around. The fields are already ripe for harvest. We haven't had a vacation Bible school in five years here. Church, the fields are ripe for harvest. And that's about to happen here this week. Today's message, and I'm not going to talk long on it. We're just going to talk briefly a little bit because I ran over last Sunday. I know that you're probably ready. Like a preacher, you know, be quiet. But hey, we're going to say whatever God has laid on my heart. You're going to hear it, okay? That's how it's going to be. If it takes till 1230, it takes till 1230, it takes till 1150, it takes till 1150. I don't know. Mr. Choice behind the lunch order. <laughs> At least that's what I heard. <laughs> but when Jesus told his disciples that the fields are already ripe for harvest, there were people. This woman just ran off excitedly to go tell the villagers, the rest of the people in the village, about what Jesus had just told them. And guess what? They're coming back to hear and to see what Jesus is all about. In just a few hours, these doors are going to open, and we may have one student that comes tonight, or we may have a hundred, I don't know, but whatever God sends us, we need to be ready. We need to be ready. Because let me tell you what also Jesus said in Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 through 38. He said this right here. And it's, well, let me tell you what the Bible says. Jesus traveled through all the towns and the villages of that area, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. He said to his disciples, and I want you to listen to this right here. This is what Jesus also said about the harvest. The harvest is great, but the workers are This morning, I may step on a few toes this morning, and if I do, I apologize. I'm sorry. And I told my Sunday school class also, I said, you may not leave here every Sunday morning feeling good. Because I'm not a feel-good preacher. I'm not going to preach to you about prosperity or about wealth. I'm going to preach to you about what Jesus said and what's in his word. But Jesus told his disciples, he said, the fields are ripe with harvest. And he also said, it's time to harvest, but we ain't got enough workers to go do it. So let me ask you a question this morning, church. Are you working? Are you working? We got a lot of people that call themselves Christians. And we got a lot of people that won't grow and do a lot of things. But sometimes we as believers, we're not willing to step out and go do it. Sometimes we just want the next person to handle it. I've heard people say before, and this is kind of crazy, but I've heard this in, in, in multiple places that I've been in. Well, we've done our due. It's time for these young people to take over. What young people? The choices that we make, the decisions that we do, how we follow Jesus now is going to determine what happens in 20 years. That's why I asked my class this morning, what's your vision for this church in 20 years? Because what we do right now is going to affect what happens in 20 years. And 20 more VBSs, what happens? I did, I'm not the one who said that the workers are few. Jesus said it right here. He said it right here. It's time to get to work. We ain't got enough people to do it. So are you working? Now I'm not saying that to make you feel bad this morning and make you think that, oh my gosh, I'm not doing anything. I need to get out there and do anything. I'm saying this to make you think and see where you are in your walk with the Lord this morning. Goliath 
somewhere between the ages of 12 and 15. That's like my, my 16 year old son standing in front of a nine foot dude. Okay, we'll just say Ben. That's like Hayden standing in front of his uncle Ben and taking him down. Yeah, that ain't going to happen. Ain't going to happen. But David did it. He stood in front of a nine foot tall giant at 12 to 15 years old and took him down. You know why? Not because anything that David did, but because God was with him. All David had to do was step out and say, Here I am. Let me go do it. God carried him the rest of the way. We covered the young side. Let's cover the old side. Moses. Now I'm not sure if you guys know this, but Moses was about 80 years old when he fed the people out of Egypt. That's pretty old. I'm not there yet, so to me that's that's kind of old. I'm not, I'm not responding. Well. <laughs> you know I love responding. <laughs> but Moses was 80 years old when he led Israelites out of Egypt. Who can tell me how long they wandered in the wilderness for? How much? 40 years. And how old did that put Moses in 40 years? 40 more. That's right. You're right. 100 and what? 120. Here's Moses at 120 years old, still doing and following what God wanted him to do. Not because Moses could do it, but because God could do it. Church, where are we? Where's our faith? I'm going to tell you this. I've said it once and I'll say it again. I'll continue to preach it until either God takes me out of here or whatever he's going to do. But if you're drawing breath in this building this morning, God got a plan for you and he's not done with you. And he needs you to do something. He's called you to do something. You may not know what it is right now, but I promise you he's going to let you know. Ask him. I mean, his word says, ask and you shall receive, does it not? But the Lord also says, if you seek me wholeheartedly, you will find me. Church, are we seeking our God wholeheartedly this morning? Are we? Because if you ain't found him, if you don't know what he wants you to do, you might not be seeking him wholeheartedly. You might be seeking him half-heartedly. You might not be seeking him at all. Everybody. Paul talks about it. Now when he was talking about this in 1 Corinthians, what was going on basically in the church of Corinth was that people were bickering on which spiritual gift was better, okay? That's what was going on, okay? Because people were like, oh man, speaking in tongues is way better than, than be just being a prayer warrior. Or being a preacher is way better than being a teacher. Or being a teacher is way better than this. Or way better than that. Or the power of healing is better than this. Or the power of doing miracles is better than this. Paul said, hang on a minute, wait! It's all important. Not one is more important than the other. Because here's how we're supposed to be as a body of believers. If you got your Bibles, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm going to read one verse and then we're going to talk and we'll go a little bit further. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting in verse 12. Paul said, The human body has many parts. But the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. God has given us many talents and many abilities. I question why God ever gave me the ability to stand up here and preach. I don't think I'm very good. But it ain't about me. God might have given you the ability to be a friend. God may have given you the ability to be a prayer warrior for someone. He might have given you the ability to be a little bit more compassionate than everybody else. Because let me tell you, sometimes a little bit of compassion goes a long way. Maybe he gave you the ability to be a little bit more empathetic. He's given all of us the ability. Maybe it's, maybe it's a little bit more than that. Maybe, you know, some of us here are, are athletic. Some of us aren't. Maybe he gave you the ability to, to be musically inclined, to play baseball. He didn't give me those abilities. But everybody has something that God has given them. Natural abilities and spiritual gifts. If you're a born again believer in Jesus Christ saved by grace, you've got 
next question is, are we even using the tool? That's my question. I get that we all have a lot going on. I understand that. Trust me, I'm as busy as the next person. I got you. But I also know that if I put God first, all that other stuff that I'm busy with will fall into place. Matthew 6, 33 says, Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, and, or the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and everything else will be added on to you. So you know what that means? That means if I put God first in everything that I'm doing, that busy schedule that I have, he'll work it out. Did y'all know that? Because let me tell you why I didn't go to church way back when, okay? Before I got back into church. One of the main reasons I didn't go was because I was tired all the time because I worked nights. My schedule was about 8 or 9 o'clock at night until whenever I got off in the morning. Sometimes it would be 2, sometimes it would be 3, sometimes it would be 7 or 8 o'clock in the morning. It just depended on when the job was done. And that was Saturday nights. So you better believe by the time I get home Sunday morning is the last thing on my mind was getting up and coming to church. I didn't want to do it. I wanted to stay in bed and I wanted to sleep because that's what I wanted to do. We all, we've been there before, right? We've been there. We've, been, we've busied ourselves with, with stuff, uh, with things that aren't, either are important, but they're not important because I'm going to just go ahead and drop a truth bomb and if this mic wouldn't break and I drop it, I drop it after I say this, but I'm not. But let me tell you right now, the most important thing in our life is the Lord. It is. Those kids that we have, that's a gift from the Lord. That job that we have that makes us that money, that's a gift from God. He gave it to me. He can take it away. But we put other things in the place where God should be. So yeah, back, back on track. Sorry. So I didn't come because I was tired. But then I, I started to come because my wife pushed me to go. And then eventually I started going to Friendship Baptist Church in, in outside of Brantley in the North community. And all of a sudden, things started just working out because I started praying and I started getting back in touch with God. And I was like, okay, I ran away and I got to come back. My dad started praying for me. And then, guess what I was able to find? I found, I found, I'm getting there, hard. I'm getting there. But I was able to find rest. Whether it be two hours or eight, God gave me what I needed to get my butt out of bed and be in his house, in his presence. Because you know why? I trusted him to do so. So before too much longer, I'm back in church. And then before too much longer after that, I'm crying, gripping the pew, saying, God, here I am. Use me. I can't run from you anymore. And then for too much longer after that, I'm standing up here preaching this sermon to y'all today. We all have a job to do. Sometimes, just with the body, just, just like the human body. We all work together, okay? What would, what, would, what would the body be like without legs? There are people that have that, or arms, or hands, or eyes, or nose. It wouldn't function like it's supposed to, right? It's the same thing with the body of Christ. If we're not using the abilities and the gift that God gave us, then the body of Christ, the church, is not functioning as it should. Paul goes on to say, he says, in verse uh, 13, he says, Some of us are Jews and some are Gentiles. Some are slaves and some are free. But we all have been baptized into one body by the Spirit, and we all share the same Spirit. He says, yes, the body has many different parts, not just one part. If the foot says, I'm not a part of the body because I'm not a hand, does that make it any less part of the body? Just because you may have a smaller, what you consider to be a smaller talent, smaller or more insignificant, if that's what you think, ability than the next person does not mean that you're any less important. It does not mean that ability, that gift, that talent is any, is any more insignificant than anyone else's. Because let me tell you what goes into making a preacher be able to be up here. First off, prayer. Not just from me, but from you guys. It takes all of you. Because I, I need a big neon sign for some, sometimes for me to see what God wants me to preach on. And sometimes I may not see it if you're not praying for me. Did y'all know that? The next thing it takes, Mr. Chuck up here, leading worship, getting you ready to hear what God's had on my heart for me to preach to you. The next
next thing it takes is my sound guys back there making sure that my microphone's working. Thank you guys, by the way. We struggle with that some Sundays. It's okay, though. The next thing goes into my, my sound and visual guys to make sure that my TVs are working. That if I have scripture that needs to go on the board, or Mr. Chuck has words that needs to go on the board, or pictures, or, or pictures, or a video, or whatever. There's a lot that goes into it. But the awesome thing about it is, is what it takes to go into a Sunday morning service, every one of you are involved in. Did you know that? Every one of you are involved in. We all have a job. Verse 16, and if the ear says, I'm not a part of the body, but it's not an eye, would that make it any less part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, how would you hear or if the whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? We got BPS coming up. And it takes a whole church body to make it work. It does. You know, God calls us to be a holy sacrifice. Did y'all know that? Sometimes that means sacrificing other things. I want you to look at anybody in the Bible that followed Jesus and ask me, or I want you to tell me, they didn't sacrifice something to follow Jesus. Every one of his disciples gave up pretty much everything they had to follow Jesus. All but one of them gave their life to follow Jesus. And the one that didn't was tortured. You can look up anybody in the Old Testament. Pretty much every one of them. Sacrifice something to follow the Lord. Jesus never said that being his disciple was going to be easy. It's going to be hard. But he did promise to be there with us the entire way. This morning I also asked, what's your vision for this church? Every one of us, if we sat and we thought about it for a minute, if we call this church our church home, you can probably think of a few things that you would like to see done or happen around here, right? Can anyone shake their head now? Just prove me wrong real quick. Okay. Yeah, I think so. There's, there's always something we can improve on, right? And the vision that we form today is going to take all of us working together and using the abilities and the talents that God gave us to do. And it starts tonight with VBS. I haven't had a VBS in five years. I don't care the reason. I don't care the reason. I'm going to tell you this right now. I don't think God cares about the reason either. But you know what he does care about? The fact that we're doing it. And the fact that we're fixing to open these doors and we're fixing to get to love on, care for, and minister to some kids who are going to come, whether it be one or 100. He don't care. He just wants us to be there, be ready, and to love on them kids. And to show them Jesus. And it's going to take every one of us to do that. Not just me. Not just the Sunday school teachers. But every one of us. And maybe you're sitting The Bible says, pray without ceasing. Pray. I know I need your prayers. I know that VBS is going to need your prayers if it's going to succeed. But it's going to need workers. Everybody has a gift and a talent. And a spiritual gift. Say your spiritual gift. Are you using it for the glory of God? Hard message, I know. We're going to have a time of invitation. And we talk about, we talk about a lot in Sunday school, don't we guys? We really do. We talk about this in Sunday school too. But I'm going to invite everyone to pray for VBS. You don't have to come to the altar. I'll tell you that right now. 
But I will say that it, it, we, we, we kind of decided this morning it means a little something to come up to the altar and pray. You don't have to kneel at the altar. You can sit at the altar. You can sit on the front pew. I can promise you, if you think you can't get up, we got a lot of strong men here that can help you. Actually, it might be the ladies helping us men up, honestly. <laughs> Let's be real, guys. <laughs> but hey, we're going to do it. Because I don't care what our vision might be for this church in 20 years. I don't care what our vision might be for BBS this next week. If you're not willing to give it to God and pray about it, it won't come to pass. It won't. God bless it. also punishes disobedience. You don't believe me, go read the entire Old Testament. This morning as we have a time of invitation, I'm going to ask you all to please stand if you can. We decided in Sunday school this morning also that there's not a single person in this room right now whose life is perfect. We are all a bunch of And being since that is how it is, there's something 